it's not the same not being at church together. It feels awkward and a little sad almost, but we want to um, continue obviously to celebrate the life of Christ and all that he's done for us. Um, just because we're not together in the church building doesn't mean he's dead, right? He's still alive. He's still victorious over the grave and he still loves us beyond words. So this morning, I'm going to actually start off before we get to our episode of Kid Flicks. I want to start off with a story uh, that comes from the Easter story. This is a little bit after um, Jesus died and uh, rose again. And it's just an amazing um, victory story. Um, and uh, this is from the book, The Easter Storybook, 40 Bible Stories Showing Who Jesus Is. I think next year when we're all together, we'll probably study through this book together. Um, I'm really excited to do that. I had hoped to do it this year, but things kind of got a little crazy on us, didn't it? So we're going to um, look at the, doing this together next year, but we're going to give you a little bit of a sneak peek by me reading this one this morning. I am with you always. This comes from Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and Acts 1, okay? It was time for Jesus, the promised son, to return to his father. He had done just what he came to do. He had died as a sacrifice in our place to bring people close to God and to each other again. Then he had come back to life, showing that he was stronger than anything, even death. One day he would end evil and death forever. He would wipe away our tears and make all things new. Jesus was leaving, but his work wasn't finished yet. Jesus told his friends to stay in Jerusalem until God's spirit came to be with them. Jesus wasn't leaving his friends alone. Because of Jesus, God himself would live among his people again. Soon they would walk with God and know him. God's spirit would remain or sorry, remind them of everything Jesus had taught and he would help them love. Jesus told them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's Acts 1.8. Jesus was sending his friends out to do the same good things he had done. They would make things new, not only for their own people in Judea, but also for their enemies in Samaria. And they wouldn't stop there. Jesus was sending them out to the ends of the earth. Because he wanted to rescue all people everywhere. Jesus promised they wouldn't do this good work alone. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's Matthew 28, 20. God's spirit would come to help. After Jesus said these things, he was carried up into the sky in a cloud. Then two angels came and told Jesus' friends that one day Jesus would return. Until then, they knew what to do. Just like this story, God commanded his disciples to go out and reminded them, hey, just because I'm not going to be here doesn't mean that I'm gone. My power and my, my love and my spirit is still here. And he's sending us out to be his witnesses. This is the perfect time right now for Christians everywhere to speak up, to love one another, to show God's grace, mercy, and, and his love to others. He didn't just call his disciples to do it. He called all of us as Christians. When we accept Christ, we accept that um, commission that he gave to his disciples. We accept that commission to go and tell others what God has done for us. He is alive. He is not in the grave. You won't find his body anywhere because he rose and he's alive and he lives within us. So I am with you always. That's a promise that we can stand on and you find it in the Bible. And God's word is full of truth and he 
will fulfill everything that he spoke in his word to us. Isn't that an amazing, wonderful thought? I get so excited, as you can tell, when I talk about it because all those other people who are following those other gods or religions or their, their leaders, you can find their grave, you can find where they are buried, you can find their bones, but you cannot find Jesus' bones or anything because he is not a, a, a human being stuck in a grave somewhere. He rose and he's alive and it's so exciting. Oh, sorry, I get so excited. But we're going to actually talk about one of the amazing things that Jesus did while he was still alive today in our Kid Flick series. Now, I hope you all got to read, or read, well, you can't read it because it is a book too, but I hope you got to see the book or <laughs> Cloudy with a chance of meatballs. You can see it here on the wall. We've replaced our others, kind of shifting them around as we move through um, the movies. But uh, Cloudy with a chance of meatballs. I hope you got to see it. It's hilarious. Uh, we absolutely love the monkey Steve. He's our favorite. He generally just says Steve. Steve. <laughs> so it's pretty funny. Um, but if you didn't, I thought just in case, I know some of our friends um, don't have the DVD or something like that. I actually printed off a synopsis and I'm going to read that to you just so, or a summary, sorry, um, just so that you kind of have an idea of what we're talking about and why we're talking about it. Um, just in case you haven't seen it or haven't read the book, okay? So when hard times hit Swallow Falls, it's town people can only afford to eat sardines. I don't know if any of you have seen what a sardine is. It's like a little dead fish. Oh, it's nasty. Okay, y'all. It stinks. You open the can and you just smell. It just, oh. Have your parents buy some just so you can smell it. Just so you know what I'm talking about. It is nasty. They're disgusting. If we were together, I would have brought a can for you guys to, <laughs> to see and smell and, oh, yeah. Taste if you want to. Flint Lockwood, a failed inventor, thinks he has the answer to the town's crisis. Now, all these people were suffering because they were eating sardines all the time. That was all they could afford. It was all there was. Okay. He builds a machine that converts water into food and becomes a local hero. When tasty treats fall from the sky like rain, but the machine spins out of control and threatens to bury the whole world under giant mounds of food. Flint finds he may have bitten off more than he can chew, and now he has to find a solution to end his machine. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce it because it's just weird, okay? If you want to hear it pronounced, go watch the movie, okay? So that's what the movie is all about. It's all about Flint trying to provide for his townspeople that are suffering and eating all these nasty, stinky, disgusting fish. Okay, sorry, my phone is pulling my dress down and making me feel weird. Hopefully I look okay. All right, so that's the movie. <laughs> sorry. Um, it kind of sounds a little familiar, right? Just a tiny bit, just a teeny, teeny, tiny, tiny bit, right? The story of a townspeople or people needing to be fed don't know if that gives you a good hint or not, but I think you're going to, you're going to get it as I talk to you about it. Okay. So the awesome thing about today's story is that it's not just found one place in the Bible. Okay. This story was important enough and exciting enough that four different people wrote about it in their books of the Bible. Okay. It is the four gospels of the New Testament, those first four books of the New Testament. And it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all four chose to write about this one story because it was so incredibly important for us to know and to hear because it speaks, oh, so wonderfully 
to the provision that God gives us. So our need to know slogan for this, um, this uh, episode. <laughs> so the need to know uh, slogan for this episode is you can't out give God. No matter how much we try, we cannot out give God. And so in Matthew, we're going to, we're going to start and we're, we're going to read actually all four um, because they each give a little bit different details. It's like if you had four different people who went and saw a concert, okay? And then you had them all four come back and tell you about the concert, okay? All four of them are going to have different experiences, right? They're all going to experience it differently and they're all gonna pick them on different things and they're each gonna have their own favorite song and that kind of thing. Everybody experiences things differently. And so today we're gonna read all four stories. They're very short, so you don't have to worry about this video being super long or anything. Um, but I do wanna read them all to you because they do give the different details and it gives such an amazing um, look at how the disciples experienced the same moment in time with Jesus differently and how they all heard and experienced the one moment differently. They were all there together. They were all with Jesus at the same time, at the same place, with the same miracle that happened, and they all experienced it differently. It's really cool. So here we go. We're going to start with Matthew. That's the first book of the New Testament. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Matthew. And we're going to read 14, chapter 14, verse 13 through 21. And if you open up your Bible and you look, there's probably a tagline at the top. And you're all going to read that and be like, oh, I know this story. Why is she reading this? Okay. Because it's Jesus feeds the 5,000. Now, did y'all get there before I got there? Flint Lockwood provides for the townspeople. Jesus here provides food for the people who are there. So I'm just going to read it through real fast. And then we'll keep, we'll go just one right after the other. I will tell you when I'm changing books and what the, um, the verses are so that you can follow along with me, okay? So here we go. I know I'm looking down reading a lot today, but there's a good reason why, okay? When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them some food. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down, sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. So there were more than 5,000 people. I know the tagline says Jesus fed the 5,000, but there was more than 5,000 people there. And there were leftovers. How amazing is that? Right? So Matthew tells us, first and foremost, book of Matthew, he tells us there were more than just the 5,000 men. There were women and children too. All right, now we're going to switch over to Mark. The book of Mark, chapter 6, and that's verse 30 through 44. 30 through 44. Chapter 6, verse 30 through 44. 
The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went by, away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd, so he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, what would take or that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down on, in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up into heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. So Mark only focuses on the men, okay? But he gave us some other details and we're gonna kind of wrap it all up in a minute. First, we're going to go back and or go forward, and we're going to read Luke 9, verses 10 through 17, okay? Luke 9, 10 through 17. So flip your Bible, pages, not the Bible itself, but the pages. All right, starting at verse 10. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he looked, took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Be Be Bethsaida. I never pronounce words right when it's like names, so I apologize profusely for butchering names when I'm doing this. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who were who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the 12 came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go get to the surrounding uh, villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. He replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish unless we go and buy food for all of this crowd. About 5,000 men were there. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everybody sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to sit before the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Again, Luke kind of follows Mark a little bit there, where he only talks about the 5,000. <clears> so see, details from different perspectives are going to be different. We're going to move on to John chapter 6. Where are you at, John chapter 6? Okay, John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. John chapter 6, 1 through 14. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of T Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside. Side, sorry, excuse me. And sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. 
When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Peter, brought pre Let me start that one again, okay? Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There, are, there was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the bar five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. So as you see, all four wrote about the exact same story. All of them mentioned the 5,000 men. Matthew tells us that was not counting the women and children that were with them. You know, full families came. It wasn't just the men. Several of them, I, well, two or three. I know Mark, Luke, and John here all mentioned Jesus healing people because he had compassion on them. Jesus is a compassionate God, okay? Jesus was compassionate, just like God is compassionate, okay? He had compassion on them, so he healed them. And he's providing for their needs, right? That's what the whole story is about, is, is providing for the needs of these people who decided to come on foot. He took a boat across a, a, a lake or a river or something, but they walked all the way around to get to where he was going to be. They didn't care how long it was going to take them or how hard of a journey it was going to be. They just wanted to follow and to hear Jesus speak. And then because of that, Jesus ends up providing food for them. Instead of sending them away into the nearby towns and villages and, and whatnot, he says, mm -mm. I'm going to use this time to show how powerful my God is. Now, in every single one of the stories, you will notice that they specify what he did with the bread and the fish, and it's symbolic, and it's awesome that this fell on this week. Normally, I, I mean, I would have mentioned it, but I really want to bring it to your attention here. So when you go back and you find it, okay, right here, I'm, I'm looking back at John specifically, because that's what my Bible is open to. And he says here, Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. All right, if we flip back to Luke 9, 10 through 17, Luke specifies taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to the heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people, okay? Matt, uh, sorry, that was Mark, that was Luke, I missed Mark. Okay, Mark, Mark 6, okay, 30 through 44 in verse 30, no, verse 40. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Are you seeing the same thing here? Are you seeing the repetition? What does Jesus do? He takes the bread and he looks up to heaven. He blesses it and then he breaks the bread and then gives it to the disciples to distribute. He took the bread, he broke it, 
and then he passed it out. As we look at the Easter story and we listen to pastor on communion Sundays, what do we always hear about? We hear about Jesus at the Passover dinner. He took the loaves of bread, said, this is my body, which is broken for you, broke it and said, take, eat, right? It's an amazing symbolism that I'm sure that the disciples didn't even realize or remember. And maybe they did. Maybe as they look back over their time with Jesus, they were like, whoa, he did this before. Now, at that moment, it wasn't quite as drastic because it wasn't right before Jesus was arrested and tried and, and hung on the cross. But it's a symbolism of what was to come, right? He broke the bread and he fed all of those people. He provided for all of those people. When he died on the cross <clears throat> and his body was broken for us, he gave salvation for all of us. It wasn't just one set of people. It wasn't just 5,000 people. It was everyone who is willing to accept him as Christ, as their savior. So it's super awesome. All of these stories in all four books, you can see it was super important for them to tell us that he blessed the bread and, and three of them tell us he looked up into heaven and he broke the bread. Did I read Matthew? I don't know that I read Matthew, but I can in a second. Matthew says, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. So they, three of them tell us that he looked, specifically looked up into heaven because he wanted the disciples to see that it wasn't by his power, but it was by God's power that he was doing this. He, like us, was God's vessel to do miracles and to do the works that needed to be done for people to believe. And that's why we're here. And that's why when I read our Easter story, that same commission that he gave those disciples when he says, take everything that you have learned from me, take what I have given you and spread it to all of the world. Go to the ends of the earth with my word and with my love, sharing my gospel, my truth with others. So I just love how all of this ties in together. If we look back at our movie, now Flint is nowhere near what Jesus was, right? But he tried to provide for his people, right? Just as Jesus provided. Now I can guarantee you that in this situation, there was no person more qualified, more ready to do what Jesus did than he was. Nobody else could have done it. Because at that time, Jesus hadn't given, hadn't um, died and went into heaven and the Holy Spirit had not come down yet. None of the disciples could do what Jesus did here. No man could do what Jesus did for these people. And in our movie, Flint did what nobody else on his little island could do. He created something that could make food from water and provide for the people. Okay. Now, Jesus story didn't have anything raining from the sky. And I'm sure that those fish and those barley loaves probably weren't as yummy as ice cream or cheeseburgers falling from the sky. Right. But the, the, the mission was the same to provide for those in need. Right. There's one hitch though. Flint's machine, because it was based on human nature and on science, he ended up having to figure out a way to stop the machine because it went fluey. Why? Because of people's greed. If you watch the movie, you'll see that the people wanted more and more and more, especially the mayor of the town. He got really greedy 
right? He got real, he wanted that next thing and that next thing and that next thing and that next thing. And as, as people, as humans, we tend to do that. We tend to want the next thing. And we're always looking for the next new phone, the next uh, gaming system, the next thing, the next cool thing. We want to be a part of it, right? That's our human nature. But human nature is faulty. But God's promises, God's miracles, God's giving is perfect. It may not be in our timing. It may not be exactly how we want it, but it's perfect in what it is and when it is. God has the ultimate answer. We just have to have faith that he's going to bring it about. And we have to stand strong and we have to stand firm in that faith that no matter what we do, no matter what we say, he's going to love us and he's going to get us through it. Now, does that mean we can just sin and do whatever we want? No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we stand firm on his word. We make sure that we're staying grounded in God. And when we ask for forgiveness, he's going to give it. And he's going to continue over and over and over to give us that forgiveness. He doesn't have to. He chooses to. Right? We cannot outgive God. No matter how much time or money or effort that we put in to life, it could be the church, it could be our home, it could be anything, our job. It doesn't matter how much time and effort we put in. And don't, by all means, do not think that I'm saying don't do that because we do need to do that. That's what I'm doing right now with you. I am putting my time and my effort into this, right? But what I'm saying is that God cannot be outdone. We can put every single moment we're awake and every single penny from our paycheck into doing God's work. And guess what? It's not going to be enough. But God's provision and God's giving to us can't be outdone. We can't outgive God. We can't do more than God could do. I want you to really grasp this. God tells us, yes, to give our 10% of our earnings, and we should. He does tell us to spend time with the poor and with the needy. And the more we do that, the more we give to God, the more he gives us in return. While it may not be a physical grasp of something like money or, or a new home or a new car or anything like that, but it's, it's in our faith. He builds our faith. Now, he could reward you with financial blessings, but what I'm saying is it's not always a tangible gift that he gives back. When we give of ourselves and our earnings and our um, effort, when we give, he gives us back in return more than we could ever imagine. We have to stay grounded in his word and we have to keep the faith. And like Flint, we just have to keep pursuing and perfecting what we can in our human nature so that God can continue to give us the answers and give us the guidance and keep on giving to us. Because the more we give, the more he gives in return. It's a never ending cycle. And we, like I said, we cannot out give God. You cannot out give God. I cannot give out, out give God. Pastor cannot give outgive God. No one can outgive God because his blessings and his giving is far superior to anything we could ever ask or imagine. Which leads me to our scripture verse for this series, which is 
God is able to do far more than we could ever ask or imagine, Ephesians 3, 20. If he can do far more than we can ask or imagine, and I can imagine a lot, and you guys can ask for a lot. Trust me, I have four kids of my own. I know you can ask way more <laughs> than we could ever, wow, provide. But God can do far more than we can ever ask or imagine. And he does it the perfect way, in a way that we could never imagine, that we could never foresee. It's not always a tangible thing that we get in return, but what we get is so much better. It's so much better. It's a life and eternity with him. It's a faith that continues to grow as we open the word and we read the next Bible story or the next scripture verse. There's so much more to a life with God than just things. God is able to do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. Ephesians 3.20. I hope you guys are memorizing that, letting it sink in, dwelling on it, because it's such an amazing verse. I do want to end with a couple of little summaries here, and then I think I'm going to pray, and then I will uh, see you guys tomorrow for our reveal about what the next movie is going to be. So make sure to be looking while you're watching this video. Maybe you'll see the hint to the next one. So Flint didn't run out of food to give to the people. Actually, it was giving abundantly more than they could eat. They were beginning to actually feel like they were going to drown in the food, right? But the next thing was better and better and better and it tasted better and it was bigger and it was amazing, right? What God gives us is better each time. The next thing he gives is so much better than the last. The next revelation that he gives us in the Bible, in, in the scriptures and the word is so much better and faith affirming than the last thing. When you get excited and you dig in, he is going to reveal things to you that you never imagined was even in there. It's mind blowing. All right. If we keep giving to God, he will never run out of giving back. Okay. Because we can't outgive God, right? And that's what we need to know today. So I want you guys right now, as loud as you can, so that your parents know what you're doing, so they hear what you're saying, okay? I want you to yell, you can't outgive God, okay? I'm gonna do it right now, and I'm probably gonna scare everybody in the house that's upstairs, because they're gonna hear me, okay? Ready? One, two, three. You can't outgive God! Awesome, good job, guys. One last thing, I want you guys to think about the Bible story, okay? And we're gonna answer three questions. And these answers obviously will be on the blog, the questions and the answers tomorrow. But I want you to open up your Bible and I want you to find these, these um, questions and answers, okay? So obviously, what did the little boy have? You guys know that one pretty, pretty quickly off the bat, right? Did the little boy keep his food to himself or did he give it to Jesus? And if he kept it to himself, how much would he really have eaten of that? How much would he have provided for? Maybe one meal? Maybe? And when the boy gave all of his food to Jesus, what happened? I want you guys to really think about those answer them to yourselves. Maybe make a, a note in the margin of your Bible or get a notebook and write it down, find out the answers, dig in, read each of these passages and see if you guys can come up with the answers, okay? 
think I'm going to leave it there for today. This is already probably a very long video, but I get so passionate about stories like this because it's amazing to look at what God did through Jesus while he was here on earth. And to think about all of these foreshadowing stories that when you really look at them, it's an amazing revelation because the disciples had no idea at that time that soon they would be sitting in a room and he would do the exact same thing, only there would be a tagline that says, this is my body which is broken for you. Instead of just breaking it and blessing it and giving it out. There was, there was more intensity to the story. It's, it's exciting. The Bible is exciting, guys. And I hope that through this series, you're beginning to see that excitement and that you're, you're, Going back, and you are reading the Bible stories that we're sharing with you, both Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. We miss being with you guys and being able to act out the movies, or the, the movies, <laughs> act out the stories with you guys like we were. But this is kind of a an intense time, and it is the, the it is intense times that we need to dig in to God's Word. And grow our faith so that when times like this is over and we're out of this, you know, virus stage and we're back together again, we are more grounded in our faith. We know more stories. We are, we are getting up and making sure that we're reading our Bible every day. We're praying every day. We have a rhythm to our Bible study time, whether it's we get up and that's the first thing we do or it's the last thing we do right before we go to bed so that we go to bed um, thinking on God's word. Maybe it's both. Maybe it's you have a specified time after uh, homework that you, that you do a Bible study. Maybe it's a family Bible study time. Whatever it is for you, I really hope during this time of us being apart, you're opening your Bibles at home. You're not just relying on me reading the word to you, but you're doing it at home as well. All right, I'm gonna do a quick prayer here to wrap this up. I'm getting super passionate again, so I need to rein myself in. I love you guys, and that's why I'm passionate about this. I love you guys, and I want you to love God. I want you to get in this word. I want you to pray. And I want you to know that we can stand faithful and we can stand without fear on God's word because it's proven throughout the ages that it never fails. God's word never fails. God's love and mercy and grace never fails. All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this lesson today. I thank you for the revelation of, of the foreshadowing and the provision that you show us, that you give. Lord, we ask that during this time of being apart, that you would continue to provide and, and reveal your love and your grace and your mercy and all of the things that you do for us to us, Father God. Help us to find that rhythm that works for our families and for us so that we can dig into your word and we can pray and we can seek after you in this really weird time. Lord, I ask that you will remind us that as much as we give of ourselves, we can never outgive you. And Lord, just bless each and every kid who is watching this video um, today and in the days to come, Lord, whatever they are going through, I ask that you would meet their need, that you would be there, and you would provide just for, like, as you did for these 5,000. Lord, we ask that you would um, just hug them, Father God, since we can't be there to do that. 
I ask that you would just envelop them in your arms and help them to know that we love them and that we miss them, but that you are there with them every step of the way and your love never fails. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys. Thank you for joining me this morning. Thank you for listening to my passionate plea. Um, but I am, I am passionate and I am pleading that you would uh, step into this new role as Christians, um, that you wouldn't just rely on church to provide that for you, but that you're, that you're opening it up and doing it for yourselves as well. I love you guys. I hope you um, are all looking for the next clues for the next video, and I hope you look on the blog tomorrow to find out what the next movie is and the answers to our questions. Although I'm pretty sure that most of you, because you are so smart, already have the answers. But check in, just make sure, and um, I'll have a new challenge on there for you guys. So I'm gonna put it out there once again. Um, if you have access to um, do videos or text messaging, send a picture, something like that. We would love to see you guys. Um, and it doesn't even have to be church related. It could be something you're learning, something you're doing. Um, if you're getting out in the sunshine, I know it's been like rainy and cloudy the last couple days. <laughs> it's not really been an option the last couple days, but um, I have pictures that I'll be sharing soon of our walk down to um, John Deere from a couple weeks ago, I think. Maybe, I don't know, I've been kind of behind. Um, but we just want to see you guys. We want to see what you're doing and what you're up to. Um, and so if you have a way to do that, please do. Um, we love you guys and, and we miss you. And so we just want to know you're okay. Um, all right, don't forget to check the blog uh, tomorrow to see the reveal. Um, and uh, that's it for this morning. I hope you guys have a fantastic Easter. Eat lots of candy. No, don't eat lots of candy. <laughs> I shouldn't say those things. Um, but just enjoy being with your family and knowing that you serve a God who is alive and well and working in and through you. I hope to see you guys check in on Wednesday night for our next ingredient of a godly life. And then I'll see you next Sunday for another episode of Kid Flicks. And I hope you have a very happy Easter. Love you guys. Bye.